Um, so my name is Christian Muntes. I'm, uh, I'm uh, comes from the other end of the university campus, from the uh, Faculty of Humanities and the Philosophy Department there, or Philosophy and Linguistics Theory of Science. And I work in the Center for Antibiotic Resistance Research uh, within uh, the part that is with social science and, and uh, humanistic aspects of this problem. And uh, especially I work with ethics because I'm a moral philosopher, so that's what I do. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So the, the ethics and value challenges that connect to uh, the problem of antibiotics resistance. And you might wonder then why should you talk about that at all? Uh, isn't it, you know, get on it, solve the problem, everybody recognizes the problem, fix it. We need what is to be done, it's just, you know, getting people on the wagon to do it. And I will try to illustrate for you, it's not so easy uh, as that. Um, it would have been nice if it had been. And I will describe a little bit then uh, in what way that uh, ethics is relevant for, for this problem, uh, for understanding it and for solving it. I will also describe some details of challenges and problems that come in, and I will do this a little bit in parts. So we have uh, a question of why we should care about this. Well, the starting point, I think, is this idea that we need to do something. So just not wait for it to fix itself. We need to do something. And whenever we need to do something uh, with human beings, usually what happens is that we want to do several things to fix the problem, but we can't do all of these things. They will run counter to each other, and they will conflict. And this is what happens in this area. So when you look at the kind of ideas that you find in uh, uh, the mission then to, to fight antibiotic resistance or to deal with it and manage it well, uh, they are in potential conflicts, the aims of this idea. So we heard before in, in other speakers here that we want to speed up innovation, especially of new antibiotic drugs, but also of other kind of technologies to be able to diagnose diseases better and select the ones that need antibiotic from those that don't need an antibiotic and things like that. So that's, a, that's a, and we need to have it quicker. Uh, that's one part of it. But we also want us not to use these drugs as much as before, to be much more conservative and rational in the use of antibiotics, what usually call antibiotic stewardship with their programs. And this is both the human and the animal use area. We also want to control resistant infections and the way that they transmit and spread into the environment. And, we, and that, including in that is also that we want to control the spread of resistant genes uh, between bacteria, for instance. And we want to fight emissions of antibiotics into the environment, both from our consumption and from the production of antibiotics, in order not to create so, such a strong selection pressure for resistant bacteria. All of this we want to do, but you can easily understand that these aims conflict with each other. So we want more new drugs faster. At the same time, we want to consume these drugs much less than before. You can easily see the problem here that if the main production of new drugs is driven by a commercial company, which is done today, these companies will be much less interested to produce new drug if we at the same time say basically, I won't take it. Uh, or <clears throat> if you want to find environmental drug emissions and for example set up systems so that we punish drug makers where you have environmental problems, for instance, then of course the price of this drug goes up, and then again you will have a reluctance to buy it, and then again you won't really fix the problem. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to control consumption, then of course the whole idea with fighting antibiotic resistance is that we want to preserve the effectiveness of healthcare, but of course, if we don't treat infections as much as before, we get less healthcare for what we do. 
So all of these things can pull in different directions and all of these aims can actually also come into conflict with each other. So that's sort of where ethics starts, right? So it's the realization that all actions that you're contemplating means that, okay, you can win something, but you will also have to give up something. And the ethical question is, what wins are worth what you have to give up in order to get it. So balancing the pros and the cons, that's what ethics is basically about, and how much then. Another side of this is that also ethics is crucial for responding to drug resistance as a problem. And here are some uh, illustrations that, for example, so using antibiotics a lot, and, and you know, using it uh, preventively, for instance, prophylactically, increases the pressure that drives the resistance problem. It, it gives more antibiotics out in the environment. At the same time, we know that there are large parts of the world where you don't have as well-ordered, rich, and stable societies as we are. So we can be safe from a lot of infections just because we have very well-built and rich societies. We don't, but in other parts of the world, it's much different. So here is a case, it's an article from just a few years ago, where you could very effectively get child mortality down by using antibiotics a lot, almost in the way that is used in the animal industry in some way, almost that you're spraying uh, with antibiotics, because there is nothing else. So you get child mortality, so you have a lot of infection in these in this societies. You have no protection against it. Nutrition is bad. Everything is bad. So then this becomes effective. This means that if you abstain from using antibiotics as much in this context, the price is paid in dead children. So here you go. You see very clearly that in order to reach one aim, you have to pay a price with the other hand. And the ethical question is, of course, OK, so what is the appropriate balance here when you need to balance these things? And uh, here's a re very recent article that addresses this question in different international contexts. Because then depending on how you value what's at stake, uh, against each other, you will reach different conclusions. So depending on what your ethical outlook is, you will here come with, the ad, with another answer than if you had another outlook. And it could also be that you have the same outlook, but you make uh, your assessment from a different context. Do you make it from a sub-Saharan African context or from a North European context? This will make a huge difference to how you value the options. Uh, <clears throat> so, and this, of course, will also affect how we can expect people to respond to different suggestions of what to do to handle this problem. And I will come back to that. OK, so we continue and go a little bit more into detail. So what? more exactly ethical challenges or or uh, are we facing here in this area i gave some examples but if you go more into detail what values are in potential conflict well <clears throat> One class of things that we, we plan to do when we do antibiotic stewardship, for example, or when we try to have surveillance to have a good picture of how much antibiotic resistance we have, is that we coerce individuals in various Ways. So if you've been abroad, for example, in Sweden on a holiday uh, within a certain time frame, uh, if you go to a hospital in Sweden, you will have to tell them and you will be put on a watch list, especially if you've been to particular countries rather than others, and even more so if you have been treated for an infection in that country. Uh, so the, and this you have to do in order to enter the hospital. You have no choice as an individual. And this is a part of you know, controlling the problem of resistant infection. Another thing, what happens then if you discover to have a multi-drug resistant infection? Well, since we can't treat it, it becomes a major infectious disease threat. You have to be isolated. And because we can't treat you with medicines, the only thing we can do is to support your life functions and hope that your body will heal in the meantime. Uh, and this might take a very long time. And in the meantime, 
you have to be isolated from other people in order to uh, prevent epidemics of this thing. So you can immediately see that there, this is going to look as problematic from the person who's subjected to this. And we also know from studies that people who have um, multidrug resistance infections are also seen in a worse way and actually also there are bad attitudes towards them in society because they are viewed as threats. So these people are being harmed by our measures to contain the infection. And this is well known from infectious disease management in other areas as well. We have the political actions, for example, then. So maybe we want to uh, tax antibiotics in various ways or certain products where antibiotics is used. Meat tax, for instance. So the global production of meat uses a lot of antibiotics. Or we could tax antibiotics themselves in order to take down the unnecessary use. So that's a proven way of trying to get an economic incentive to have people change, right? But of course, this will mean that someone will have to pay this economic price. Uh, or we have rules that say, well, hey, you can't really market this antibiotic unless you have proven that it's been produced in an environmental good way, for instance. Well, okay, that restricts immediately the freedom of certain stakeholders in this area. Uh, <clears throat> It's also the fact we want to get the new drugs going, right? So we need to invest a lot in this research that we've seen in other parts of this course. But as we've also seen in this part, this research is very uncertain. It's, it's very risky to invest in a, in a possible target for a new antibiotic. Po very probably it won't be something that you can use. Uh, so it takes a long time and lots of researchers. So it's a risky investment. We could have used these resources in other ways. Another way that's been contemplated is that, okay, so as we also see, so when we develop a new antibiotic, it's, it's also always a potent risk that this antibiotic is too dangerous for human beings. It needs to be dangerous to the bacteria, but if it's dangerous to bacteria, it's potentially also dangerous to the human being. And it's the question of dosage, uh, of how much you take and how often and so on. And in order to fine tune that, you do research on animals, but also on human beings. And one way to speed up the development is, of course, to accept more risk in this research uh, and have more risky projects to test new drugs in order to speed up the whole innovation process. And there, of course, you will have price paid by those people who participate in the research and are harmed by side effects that were not anticipated. And then, of course, <clears throat> In a global response to this problem, uh, you will have to ask yourself, OK, so when you have the situation like you have in some countries in sub-Saharan Africa, then that you basically need antibiotics to have children live, uh, you have nothing else. So should they then pay the price for this burden of a global overuse of antibiotics? Or should the price be paid somewhere else? Or should they pay the price, but we help them to handle the problem in another way, which means that we participate in paying the price for the problem. So you get the question of how to distribute the burdens, the price of handling this problem also. And all of these questions then, you can link to very general classical, ethical, and political sort of value dimensions. So the first thing you have, how much should we respect the integrity and the sort of the autonomy of people that are potentially a threat uh, through spreading uh, multi-resistant bacteria? How much should we be prepared to restrict the freedom of people and of business in order to handle the problem with overuse and so on? How much should we <clears throat> be prepared to take risks in order to get a good thing at the other end? So that's the idea of how many eggs to break in order to get the omelette. It's a classic question in all moral philosophy. And 
What does it mean to act responsibly, to have a responsible way of handling the unknowns and the risks of developing new drugs in the face of this problem? And also then, last but not least, the question of justice, of how to allocate both uh, the good things and the bad things of handling this problem well. So that's one part then, but there's also another layer to ethics in this particular area, and that's the layer that when you look at the stakeholders, the actors that can participate or not participate in actions in this area, <clears throat> They come from very different parts of society and of the world. So I will also always mention different parts of the world, but you also have, for example, different professional rules. So as a doctor, for instance, you have a very different professional rule than if you are a research scientist. So a doctor is part of the job that you take on a responsibility for a particular human being that is your patient. And here comes the research scientist and says, well, hey, I want to experiment in your, on your patient in order to get these new antibiotics that could benefit not your patient, really, but these other patients in the future. So this is already part of sort of medical research ethic, but here it becomes more drastic in face of the potential threat of the antibiotic resistance, but also in, fa in face of this that's speeding up these trials and taking more risk could actually help to have a faster drug development. And that's just one example. Another example is how individual people think. So you think about your own situation as a human being in your social context. If someone comes and asks you, OK, I want you to take sick leave for another week in order not to take an antibiotic. But for you, that may mean that you lose your job. You have a temporary employment. And they, so you work at, at whatever kind of thing, temporary job, the gig economy and so on, and they won't call you anymore because they don't think you can trust you because you're on sick leave all the time. So this is a reality for a lot of people nowadays, and more and more people, even in rich countries like war. Can, it, can you say that it's rational for such a person to accept the word from the doctor that will now get a prescription? Or can you anticipate that this person would rather maybe go online than find antibiotic in some other way that's not really allowed, for instance? Well, then you have not solved the problem. So you have, so besides conflicting values and balancing those, you also need to handle the fact that different parties will assess this uh, uh, values from different positions and in different roles. So as a, as a private person, so I'm a researcher in this area, so, and then I'm thinking with one hat on, I'm also a parent with a daughter that's sometimes sick. And when I think about that, I think with a completely different hat on and different priorities. And I think most people are like this, and you can recognize that these things can come into conflict. So those conflicts also need to be handled in a good uh, solution to the problem. Right, so I stopped there. So now we're going into a little more detail about the ethical tensions uh, in various dimensions. So if someone has any question here. Yes, question. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking, I was thinking about this famous case of typhoid Mary. I don't know if you know anything about this. This is a woman in the 1940s, 50s, who had a chronic infection with uh, typhoid, but she wasn't sick. But she was a cook, and she worked in private houses, and she basically made everyone else sick. And they tried to get her to stop doing that, and they eventually locked her up. I mean, they just put her on an island outside New York yes. and left her there the rest of her life. Yes. Even though she was not actually sick. Yes. Is, is, I assume this is the sort of thing you're talking about. So this, this, is, this is an extreme uh, uh, variant of a very common type of tension that you find in, in infectious disease management. Actually, that's often in infectious disease work, like in a vaccine program or, or when you try to handle an epidemic, you're dealing with something on the population level. And the important thing is not to save every individual. 
what you need, what you want to accomplish is a collective effect. So with the vaccination, you want to have enough people take the vaccine in order to have this immunity that protects everybody. Uh, when the handling the, the epidemic, you need to contain enough people that are infected in order to stop, not every disease instance, but to stop the spread. So that's what you want to do, uh, in order, because the problem is here is on a massive scale. It's not only an individual problem. But I want to take a connecting example here. So take this example. Uh, once again, the private person, right? Uh, and <clears throat> so you come to the hospital, you have a, some kind of problem, and you've been on holidays. And they're asking you to fill out this form which is this screening that you do already now in Sweden and in Holland and a lot of countries to see whether or not you're a high risk sort of for multi-drug resistant infection. And as it happens, you took a holiday abroad quite recently. And as it happens, you hit your toe on a rock and you had that attended to in a care center, local care center. And truthful as you are, you report this on the form. This means that if you come in ill at this hospital, you will be subjected to all of these precautionary measures to protect not you, but other people. Uh, and these measures will not be very nice for you at all. And they will have new, no therapeutic value for yourself. And the backside of that is, of course, that when, okay, so you could say that, well, all right, the eggs and the omelette, once again, in order to, to you know, to, to keep your teeth healthy, you need to take some suffering at the dentist. It's the same kind of thing here. Uh, but what happens when this gets widely known? Of course, people will start to avoid, be likely, more likely to avoid contact with hospitals. Because they want, they would prefer to go on holidays, but they won't like to run the risk, or they will lie when they fill out the forms, which completely undermines, of course, your policy aid once again. So this is a good illustration how the perspective is really important when you think about how to design interventions in this area to really get the result that you're after. At the, in the same way, right? So if we deny people prescriptions for antibiotics, but they go online and find the antibiotics in another way, actually the problem might be even worse because the antibiotics they get online is much more unsafe and uncertain and might end up having even more antibiotic residue in the environment, for instance, as, as a side effect. So the, it's a really complex when you start to think about this tension and it affects how effective different interventions will be because values and the way that we balance values is an important part on how we decide to do and how we decide to live. So ethics is not only an abstract thing here, it's a concrete factor that actually influences how we can expect policies to work. So I'll come into a little bit of challenges that we are thinking a lot about in our research in this area. And one challenge we already touched about, that you have, you have different stakeholders that are important when you address this problem, but they come or are based in different institutions. So one, and, and these institutions bring with themselves different ethos, if you like, different ways of balancing different values. It's like, you know, so the, the school system and the military, they have very different aims, if you think like that. So neither of those are really relevant in this area, but that illustrates that they will pursue very different values and they will trade off conflicts of values in very different ways. Uh, <clears throat> So one thing is then that you have, on the one hand, the classic role, the clinical ethics of an ordinary doctor that thinks about his or her patients, the individuals, and their health. Uh, 
and then you have the more overarching public health structure, especially if you expand it to a global perspective, where you're not really thinking about any particular patient anymore. You're thinking about populations and health patterns in populations and how you would like to improve them or to prevent that you have uh, worse developments in the future. And so the doctor has this focus on that people come to a doctor with a problem and the doctor is supposed to fix the problem. This is like when you have a, you know, something's broken and you call up the plumber or the electrician or something like that. It's a kind of a reparation perspective that you work with. The public health and the global public health perspective works with this primary prevention perspective. Rather than sort of fixing the pipe when it's broken, you want to make a system where no pipes break or as few pipes break as possible. And there's a huge conflict here. And I think the examples we had about infectious disease illustrates this, right? So it might actually be that in order to contain the infection, you harm the individual patient. Or in order to map the spread of resistant bacteria and genes in the hospital, you induce people not to visit you when they have a health problem because they are afraid of the consequences if they are ranked as high risk. So, and there are different, depending on what perspective you take. And of course, both of these stakeholder perspectives have to be part of the solution. You can't take them out. Both have to be present. And how do you solve this tension? Another example is, of course, how you think about business ethics uh, versus this global public health thing. And that's relevant when you look at the stakeholders in the pharma industry, of course, but also in the farming. So farming is mostly a commercial activity uh, that goes on with the profit motive. So if you come from a business perspective, it's not really public health that is the aim that you aiming for. You're aiming for making money, and so the price and the costs and the market shares and so on is in focus. And if you're an executive in a business, if you're a CEO, for instance, in, in a public company, you are obligated by law to do what's best for the shareholders. You can't really choose to do anything else. So you're governed by what the board told you is the target this year or the next five years or something. And usually it will have to do with money and not public health. So this, for example, so if the board decides that, well, hey, this about, you know, getting new antibiotics is not, doesn't really seem to make so much money, let's make skin cream instead. This is what you are obligated to do. Uh, and, and the whole institution of business rests on this obligation. So how should you think about that if you're in a situation where if all the companies start to make skin creams to make money in the short run, at the end of the day, in the long run, there will be no healthcare system worth selling drugs to anymore. So for instance. And then you have, of course, different kind of institutional ethical communities. So we already seen a little bit about this. So for example, the clinical perspective and the research perspective are already mentioned. But also, so we have one uh, agency in Sweden, for instance, that's, that's tasked with seeing to it that the procurement, buying drugs by the Swedish health system is as cost effective as possible. And this, but this, as we have seen in other parts of this course, this system at the same time means that they're letting drug producers are not handling the environmental problem, for instance, off the hook. And they are even rewarded in this system because they can offer cheaper products because of this that are, from a healthcare perspective, just as good as the other drug, but from an environmental perspective, they're worse. 
So that agency will think about this problem in a very different way than, for example, an environmental health scientist who's worried about antibiotic resistance and emissions from factories, for instance, like Joachim Larsson, who visited the course before. So the, the stakeholder perspective means that you're thinking about the problem and the stakes in a very, very different ways. Another thing is we live now in a globalized world, but at the, and we really like to travel, and, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, when we travel, with us travel the multi-resistant germs and the genes that can transfer to other germs, and so on. We are very concretely contributing to the problem. And this can be seen also in other areas. If I go, for example, from Sweden, I go on a holiday to uh, another country where everything is much cheaper and it's very exotic and so on, very likely is that several things that I could carry with me, which is trivial for me, because I can enjoy the Swedish healthcare system, will be a life-threatening thing for people who live there. Just an ordinary mild influenza. And that can have to do with the socioeconomic factors, but also, for example, in variations in what different populations are accustomed to in that way. So you have a tension here between the way we want an open and globalized world, but the same open and globalized world also contribute to the transmission of resistant infection and resistant bacteria and resistant genes between them, bacteria. And that brings into the next thing, because as I think being clear already, so if we're going to act on this problem, it's not only Sweden, it's not only Northern Europe, it's not only Europe, it's not only the high income part of the world, it's the entire world that actually needs to act together. And we need to be able to distribute the tasks and to distribute the pros and the cons. Uh, what you get by solving the problem, but also the burdens you need to take on in order to solve the problem. And this creates collective action problems. We already see them uh, on a high level in, for example, climate policy. And you have similar problems here. And I'm going to explain the basic logic of a collection act active problem, auction problem. So you have the situation that we have some kind of ethics that we agreed on, so you managed to do that. We solved a lot of the issues I've already talked about, and, and we decided that we really need to get to it and solve this antibiotic resistance challenge. So we, and we need to do X in order to do that. And in order to do X, these three other things need to be done. So three stakeholders need to act in a coordinated way to get X. This is like we have three people, everybody has to pinch in a fiver in order to be able to buy the case of beer or soda or coffee or whatever your preferred product. Right, so this is a classic collective action. Collective action is necessary to get what you need to get. Right, and we have these three people here that are supposed to do. So P1, P2, P3 are supposed to do X1, X2, X3. Everything set for success. And they agree on the norms and values. They agree that this is really desirable to have done. But they also have other things that they care about, like most of us. We don't only care about one thing. We have other priorities in our lives. Which actually means that at the end of the day, we won't do X1, X2, X3. We will do Y1, Y2, Y3, and we won't get the X that we aimed for. This is the basic logic of a collection, collective action problem. So suppose now, and in order to get a very interesting uh, and I think realistic illustration, suppose that what X is costs some money. Society must use resources in order to get something done. For instance, sponsor industry to develop new drugs or something like that. To do that, we need people to agree to pay a little more tax to have this done. Or to agree to have something else a little bit less in order to have this to be done. 
Right, so this means that in order to get x down here, we need either to accept a little bit raised taxes or a little bit less government services. Very simple. We recognize this, right, from day-to-day -day politics. It's all, every election, it's about this. And we will prefer, at the end of the day, to vote for the party that say, don't raise the taxes or don't take away the government service. And this seems to be the reality in a lot of areas. And this is the collect one example of many, many, many of collective action problem. And the big question is that, okay, so how do you solve collective actions problems in order to get the good thing that you were after, the X, the handling of the antibiotic resistance problem? Here's a lot of different examples. So, for example, patients are asked to use antibiotics to accept that they are refused prescriptions of antibiotics. But that has a price for them. And they will value that price against the collective project. So will they accept it, will they not? Voters, as I said, business have to accept actions that will reduce their freedom. For instance, to say that, okay, you have to fulfill certain environmental criteria in order to qualify to sell your drugs, for instance. Okay, so the reaction to that might be that they say, okay, or they say, okay, we go to another country and do business instead. And then you haven't really achieved anything. Or states that also need to collaborate, but they have very different priorities and very different uh, uh, stakes when you look at it from a global perspective. Right, so then to the last segment of this talk, the other two challenges I'm going to take up. Right, so <clears throat> I've already talked about a little the problem of acting on uns under uncertainty in this area. So the innovation problem illustrates this very well. So it's very difficult to know when you start if you're going to get a really novel antibiotic formula. It's very difficult to know what's going to work at the end. So it means you have to invest enormous resources running the risk of getting nothing, of course. So how should you think about these kinds of... But we also uncertain what different kind of actions here, intervent social interventions, policies, how well are they going to work, given the collective action problems, given the way that people have different stakes that pull in different directions, given that even if people recognize that this is an important problem to handle. So how should we then valuing the fact that we don't know how well these policies will work at the end of the day? So how should you act under this assumption? Well, okay, so research ethics is then one place that's uh, uh, area that is affected then. So in a special issue of a journal that we recently published, we had some authors that, uh, that actually said that, okay, so one way of speeding up antibiotic resistance development, uh, antibiotic development, sorry, uh, <coughs> is to uh, do the kind of research not only when you find sick people and test the drug on them, but you actually make people sick in order to test on them. And this is a very controversial method, but it's used to some extent, depending on how sort of serious the infection is. But of course, in this area, it will be a high-risk endeavor for the person in question, because you want, we want to infect you with a multi-drug-resistant infection in order to test drugs on you. And they say, okay, but let's handle this by paying people the price that they asked for in order to take the risk for it for the rest of us. So should we do this? Is this an acceptable way of dealing with risks and uncertainties in order to speed up the innovation, for instance? Normally in research ethics, we don't accept to pay people to take risks that are unnecessary for them. And of course, in this case, so this, this this research has no benefits at all for the participants, of course. Actually, it's potentially harmful for the participants. Very likely so, in this case. So should you, should you accept practices like that, for instance? Well, 
facing this challenge? Maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. It's very difficult to apply the thinking from a standard research ethical situation in this area because the challenge is not no more anymore that you have one individual is sick and another individual is sick and another individual is sick. The problem is that you have this structural threat that undermines the entire institution of public health and healthcare. So that sort of changes the situation a lot and the way you might be prepared to think from an ethical standpoint. In the same way that you change your valuing of stakes in a catastrophe situation, for instance. So all, and this also applies then to new policies. So here you have a lot of uncertainties, and most of these uncertainties have to do with how will people respond to the policy. So say that we offer all these fancy financial incentives for industry. How will industry respond? Well, most likely they will throw all the money in order to get the financial support from the government, but not necessarily in a way that leads to effective drug development. And we've seen in a lot of areas to create financial incentives for business is a very tricky thing to do because business will do the minimal thing in order to qualify for the subsidy of all the support. And this is the logical business. It's not to moralize over business. It's just this is the way that business works, and this means that you must accept that there's a huge uncertainty in working with financial incentives for business. But the same also if you work with the rules, if you taxes, for instance, that you force taxes. So, that's, so this might make industry to adapt, but also to flee. And then you gain nothing. But also, at the end of the day, you will have the problem that policies will have to be decided by politicians. Politicians, in order to have sustainable policies, need the support of people. If you're a democracy, in terms of voting, if you're not a democracy, in terms of not so many riots on the streets, or something like that. And at the same time, we saw there are a lot of reasons for different people not to accept the consequences of different policies for themselves. So this leads to the last challenge that we actually published recently a little bit about, uh, which is then, so suppose now that you solved all the basic ethical questions here, you decided how to balance the stakes and so on, and the pros and the cons of, for example, the screening for multidrug resistant infections in hospitals or something like that. You come up with an action and the effect of the action is actually exactly the one you aim for, except that people defect. They won't collaborate. For example, they don't go to hospitals and they avoid hospitals, or they lie on the form, or something else. So your action won't actually ha deliver the good thing that you wanted it to deliver because of the way that people respond. And you can't say that people are stupid or evil because they respond as they do for good reason from their point of view in their context, as we saw before. So perspective, once again, is, is important and role is important. Okay, so then what we often do in politics is to say, okay, we have to explain to people why this is so important. So we don't only have the action, we also have a story that we tell about why this is so important. So do, this is rhetorics. The first is logic, the other is rhetoric, so to speak. And if you're lucky, the story will be accepted and people will take on the responsibility to follow the rules. In a lot of areas we do. We all understand traffic rules, even when there's nobody else on the rule road, we stop for the red light and wait. So this is the proof that we can actually function in that way. We're not only hopeless uh, individuals in that way. But you also run the risk that they actually won't like the story at all, and it may, may even increase the resistance to your policy. Here are you telling us what an important problem this is. Well, you come telling us this story when you fix this and this and this and this and this. Then we can get over to antibiotic resistance, make the trains run on time, 
before we get to the next thing. It's a very common reaction when, when politicians tell stories about why their policies are so good. But this is a risk here. And then, of course, you can adapt your action so that it's less costly and less burdensome for individuals. So you don't have to fill in so many questions on the form. Or um, we don't have, if you have been abroad anyways, just certain target countries. Or something like that. But of course, the more that you adapt your action to the resistance, the less effective it will be to curb the problem that you're after. So a less effective screening of multidrug resistance in hospitals in this case. Example I take. So the original justification goes away when you buy yourself the acceptance of the policy. This is a classic problem in politics, and I think that we will be more about these kind of problems and how to solve them in practice in another lecture. But this is the basic structure of the problems, and it has to do with the fact that people value different things from different perspectives and upholding different kinds of roles. And that enough support is necessary to have effective policies. <clears throat> And the problem is, and of course, if you're a politician, you're controlling the state, you're controlling the police, you're controlling you know, the courts, you're controlling the military at the end of the day. So of course you can force a policy on your population. Easier so if you're not a democracy. But the, the more you force the population, very, very likely the more resistance you will have. So instead of having the effective policy, you might end up with the total political blocking. So we have several examples of that. So you have a misguided policy, and there's a scandal. And then nobody can talk about this kind of solution for 20 years. Everybody will say, you're an idiot. Didn't you hear about that other example when everything went to pieces? So in this case that we're using... So if you're pressing on with this screening on people in hospitals, it's very heavy combined with very heavy measures when you find a risk person and so on. There will be a revolution, basically. People won't participate at all. And, and you will never more be able to raise even a milder suggestion of a screening in order to map the resistance in a hospital. This is a well-known problem that you need to deal with in infectious disease management. So when you go in and try to contain an infection, if you go in too hard, you create more problem that you ha than you handle, actually. Both because you might harm people too much and infringe on their rights too much, overly brutal in that way, but it could also be that you create the people that people don't, if the infectious disease doctor comes and wants to talk to them and they say, no, go away, I won't talk to you. Well, what do you do then? Okay, you have to fetch the police, but if we're talking about hundreds and thousands of people, this is now becoming a major societal problem. It's really not the solution to go that way. So you need to have the acceptance of the measures that you take enough of it in order for the policy to be possible to implement in an effective way and actually have what you aim for with the policy. So that's the end of my lecture and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Please.